lectures here in world history. Today as we wrap up the Reformation, we're going to look at the Reformation in England or how the Reformation was uh, used in England with the Tudor family history. Really this is going to be Henry VIII's story. He is king of England, he is the leader of the Tudor family, and he's going to change the church in ways that suit his needs as you're going to find out. And this is a pretty wild story. We've got one constructive response question we're going to seek to answer from all this. It says, who was Henry VIII and how is he significant to the Reformation? So uh, there's no doubt we're going to be able to answer that question based on the Tudor family history here. So the Tudor family is um, really a, a dynasty, one that Henry VIII is going to want to live on for a long time. So I'm going to do a little background information here, but ultimately this story is going to be looking at Henry and his quest for a son. So let's start the Tudor family history by looking at Henry VII. Henry VII uh, is king of England and he marries uh, Elizabeth of York. And that's not a story that we're particularly interested in. However, Henry and Elizabeth do give us three children. Um, we're going to talk about the youngest first, which is a daughter. They're going to take their youngest daughter, Mary, and they're going to marry her off, as most families of this kind of power and strength would do, to other countries. They're going to marry their, their daughter off for a political marriage. So they marry their daughter, Mary, off to King Louis the Twelfth. Of France so she's out but the eldest daughter is uh, or sorry the eldest son I should say his name is Arthur Arthur is going to marry Catherine of Aragon and it looks as if this is the marriage that will be the king and queen that will rule England for quite some time problem is Arthur dies and so Catherine is basically left without a husband. She's a queen, but she's not the English queen. She's actually from Spain. And so she either needs to get out of town or remarry somebody in England so she can keep her power. Well, we've seen two of the kids here of Henry and Elizabeth. Arthur being the oldest, Mary being the youngest, but they had one more son, which is the person who's going to step in and help out in this situation, which is going to be Henry VIII. And he's the cornerstone of this whole story. So look at what happens here. They have three kids. Their first kid, Arthur, dies. And so you have Catherine here, who eventually marries the second son, Henry. So Catherine's actually married to two brothers obviously not at the same time which uh, is going to keep her queen of england now henry he was a renaissance man in his youth he could ride he could wrestle he was well educated um very athletic in his youth that's not the image we typically see of him uh later on in life as he gains quite a bit of weight but henry really was a renaissance man but henry wanted more than anything, uh, he wanted a son. And so it was very important that the uh, king and queen have a son so that uh, that son could someday be king and continue on the Tudor family lineage. Well, Catherine and Henry do have a child together. They have Mary. So Mary's a little bit of a disappointment to the family because she is female. Well, she is uh, offered as a political marriage with Spain, and you have to understand where religion plays in all of this, because when you look at England at the start of this story, one thing we haven't made very clear yet is that they're very, very Catholic, okay? Martin Luther is alive. He's out there challenging the church uh, kind of as we speak. And so everybody who is Christian really at this point is Catholic, which includes Henry and Catherine. 
Well, they have Mary, and they're not all that thrilled about Mary. Um, and so Henry tries to figure out what his options are. How can I get rid of my wife? He doesn't want to kill her, uh, but he wants to annul the marriage or he wants to divorce his wife. Well, in the Catholic Church at that time, it's not allowed. So Henry is kind of in a tough spot. And so what he decides to do, he goes, I'm king of England. I can do whatever I want. So Henry decides to start his own church. So Henry creates the Church of England. Well, if you're saying you're not Catholic anymore, then you're breaking away from the Pope. So this is a Reformation Act. He is essentially becoming Protestant because he's no longer a Catholic. And the whole reason he wanted to do this is because now he can divorce his wife. Now he can marry somebody else legally, and the Pope can do nothing about it. So he doesn't really actually do anything bad to Catherine. Some say he locked her up in the tower, but he basically divorces her, and she kind of continues to live a pretty good life. We're going to come back to her daughter, Bloody Mary, here in a little bit. You might be looking at that, wondering what that means. Trust me, I'm going to tell you that story as well. So Henry is now free to marry whoever he wants. And the next woman he marries is a woman named Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was young. She was beautiful. She caught his eye right away. And so those two get married, and voila, they have a kid, but it's not a son. It's actually going to be Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Elizabeth that you've heard about in the Elizabethan era that we talked about during the Renaissance, the most famous women that's ever lived. Well, Henry gets impatient again. He wants to have this son. He wants to have that son now. And so he makes up some scandalous rumors that Anne Boleyn is cheating on him and, and sleeping with other people in the, the castle. And, of course, you can't do that. You can't do that to the king. That's a very, very terrible offense. So he has her sentenced, and she is executed. Her head is chopped off. So Anne Boleyn becomes the first victim of Henry's newfound uh, power as the head of the Church of England. Of course, now he's free to marry yet again. So he marries Jane Seymour. And you'll notice I've got a little heart there. Jane Seymour, we really do think, was Henry's true love. And we say that because um, as he got older, when he started planning his funeral, essentially, uh, he wanted to be buried right next to her. She does die. Not at his hand. She actually dies uh, in childbirth, uh, giving birth to a son, Edward VI. Edward is the son that Henry thinks he wants. They find out Edward's really not a very strong boy. He's very ill. Uh, and Edward does die long before Henry does. So in a way, he gets his son, but he doesn't get the son that he wants. And Jane has thus passed away. So he's in the same spot he was in before. He needs a new wife to give him a new son. So he marries Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves was a marriage where he was basically shown a picture of her, a portrait, and she looked beautiful, and he said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll marry her. Uh, she comes from a distant country and shows up, and she is not the attractive woman he thought she was, so he gets bored of her pretty quickly, and he has that marriage annulled almost immediately, and he's free to marry again. Luckily for her, she, she's not killed, she's not, she doesn't have her head chopped off, she's basically brushed aside, um, and actually continues to live a pretty good life in England um, through money from the king. So here he's got four wives, he's had Catherine, who's still alive, Anne Boleyn, whose head's been chopped off, Jane Seymour, who died in childbirth, Anne of Cleves, who basically is just brushed aside, and he's free to marry yet again, so he marries Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard is much younger than Henry, by a good 30 years or so. He's a little bit older at this point. He's in his 50s. She's in her 20s. Um, she's pretty. She's young. She's flirtatious. And that's going to cause some major problems. Where Anne Boleyn was rumored to have been sleeping around uh, under or behind Henry's back, Catherine Howard actually did it. And so you can see Anne of Cleves nor Catherine Howard provide 
Henry with a son, and Catherine is put on trial and found guilty, and her head is chopped off as well. So he's free to marry one more time. He marries Catherine Parr, um, and he actually dies while he is married to her, and they never have any children. Now, mind you, the big cornerstone of all of this is the fact that because he breaks away from the Catholic Church to create his own uh, Church of England, he is now Protestant. All of this is Protestant. But when Henry dies, when he's uh, married to Catherine, the next question is who takes over? Will you go to bloodline? The next in the bloodline is Mary, his first daughter. She's still Catholic. Though he broke away, she remains strong to the Catholic faith. And that's where she gets the name Bloody Mary. She, as she took over, she wanted Catholicism to be the rule of the land. So under Henry, it start, the, the country is Catholic, Catholic. He changes it to Protestantism when he creates the Church of England. When Mary comes to power, she changes it back to Catholicism, and she kills a bunch of Protestants, those who won't adhere to um, the Catholic faith, so she gets the name Bloody Mary. It's actually a famous story where she had three Protestants burned at the stake right in London, um, and there's actually a memorial at that place even today. I had a former student take a picture of that for me. So she gets the name Bloody Mary. Now, she and her husband have a child. At least that's what people think is happening, that she's pregnant. Oh, everybody rejoice. The queen's going to have a kid. They find out it's stomach cancer, and she's actually dying. Well, she gets really, really paranoid at this point because she knows if she dies, especially without an heir, the next person in line is her half-sister, Elizabeth. Well, look at Elizabeth. She is Protestant. She was born to a Protestant mother. And so Mary is afraid that when Elizabeth comes to power, she's going to make England Protestant. So she basically says, Mar uh, Elizabeth, I can have you killed. You need to promise me that when I die, that you'll keep England Catholic. And Elizabeth basically says, no, I can't do that. And lucky for Elizabeth, uh, her older sister, older half-sister, because they're same father, different mothers, um, that she is not killed. And so Mary does pass away, and Elizabeth comes to power. So it starts out as Catholic under Henry. He creates the Church of England, with changes England to Protestant. Mary comes to power after Henry dies, changing England back to Catholicism. And then Elizabeth comes to power afterwards, changing it back to Protestant. She starts the Anglican Church, and that's where England still is today as Protestants. So it's a wild story that starts with Henry wanting a son more than anything else. He ends up with six wives. Two of their heads are chopped off. One dies in childbirth. One of them gets brushed aside. One of them is alive when he dies, and ultimately his two daughters take power. And that is the story of the English Reformation, the story of Henry VIII and the Tudors. It's a wild one, but it shows us how uh, the Reformation reaches England and how they go from Catholic to Protestant, back to ca Catholic again, and then finally back to Protestantism. So that is our story for today. It's wild. Hope you learned something. We'll see you next time.